Uh, thank you very much and um, appreciate again the invitation to share uh, some of our work that we've been doing over the last uh, few years. And this work actually is, represent is representative of a collaboration between the International Spine Study Group, which is the largest registry for adult deformity in the U.S., as well as the registry in Europe. So this is uh, combined work. I want to start out with a, with a question for you guys, and I know, we, and we do one of these meetings as well at UCSF, and our industry partners are very important to us in terms of uh, uh, supporting our courses and our work. Uh, but I want you to take a step back and think, just for a moment in your own minds, how do you think we can make adult deformity surgery safer and better and less variable, more precise, and more cost effective? Where is that solution going to come from? Is it going to come from an implant? Is it going to come from 3D printing? Where are we going to find that, that answer? And then think, what has the evidence been over the last decade? How much has implant innovation, since the first multi-axial screw was developed a long time ago, how much, have, how much has screw design changed the outcomes and complication rates in our patients? What's going to move this needle? Well, maybe surgeons can get better, but are, are tumor surgeons really going to be better than Mark Bilski? Are deformity surgeons going to be better than Larry Lanky in the future? How much better can surgeons actually get? And you can actually study this. You can use predictive analytics to estimate the limits of human performance. They actually can accurately estimate how fast a human will ever be able to run and they can predict when in Olympic Games, uh, uh, what, what the actual 100 meter times will be, and what is the rate of increase and the limit based upon biomechanical data and uh, previous data. And I don't want to focus this kind of a, just on general AI, but I want to just tell you just a kind of a brief story which puts what I think the, you know, the future of AI in, in, in surgery in its proper context. So, a long time ago, uh, Stockfish 8 and um, Deep Blue uh, beat the best uh, human chess player, Gary Kasparov, and um, he actually said uh, after that match, he thought he, there was no way he could lose, and he said after that match, he was actually frightened when he noticed that the AI in those computers was so much smarter than he was. He actually had a feeling of actually being frightened, confronted with that kind of intelligence. Well, Stockfish 8 had the knowledge of the entire history of chess. It had every move that every master had ever made, and it could calculate 80 million moves a second. And so it's no, not a surprise that Stockfish 8 was the reigning chess champion for so many years. However, uh, in my neighborhood, uh, Google developed another uh, type of machine learning AI called AlphaZero. Uh, AlphaZero was not given any of the uh, history of chess. It was just given the uh, ultimate goal of, of the chess game, how to win and what the, what the moves were for each individual player. And then uh, AlphaZero played itself. And do you know how long it took AlphaZero, with no knowledge of chess, to actually defeat Stockfish 8, uh, the, the reigning champion with the knowledge of the entire history of chess and every master that ever played? It took it itself four hours to be able to beat Stockfish 8 in learning, in computer learning, machine learning how to play chess. So to me, that was pretty amazing. Uh, and if you look at what AI's done in healthcare over the last uh, several years, this is the um, recent map, uh, was it maybe uh, six months ago, of all the FDA approvals for AI software. And most of this has been in histology, uh, radiology, but I'll tell you it's coming uh, in, with gangbusters to surgical uh, decision making. And why do we need this? Well, we have a tremendously aging population, I, I've shown this slide many times, but our aging population is going to be, is going to suck financial money from uh, mature economies throughout the world, from first world economies, not just through musculoskeletal system, but also through dementia, through cardiovascular disease. So if we want to be able to, to have the financial resources and direct them most appropriately, when the number of our procedures is growing, if we want to maintain and sustain adult deformity surgery, we're going to have to figure out how to direct these resources better. Cost of uh, musculoskeletal disease in the U.S., $800 billion uh, a year. Spinal deformity in 2011, I, I couldn't find any more recent data, $80 billion. 
So these are very expensive operations, and we know that change is coming. One approach is to limit care to the most robust patients. So you say, okay, I'm in charge of population-based health. Uh, I'm going to direct my resources to those uh, less likely to have complications, and that's how I'm going to lift population health. But that logic is, is severely flawed, because if you really want to lift quality, if you want to lift HRQOL and disability, actually the data shows that the most disabled patients with the highest frailty scores, the oldest patients actually have the greatest boost in their health from complicated operations. And this is from a PSO paper we did years ago where the older patients were more likely to reach MCID. I think the approach, and if I go back to the first couple slides, I think the approach is really going to lie in the AI uh, providing augmented intelligence for us so that we can figure out how to best direct these resources to patients that are likely to improve the most um, and not waste our money with expensive operations on patients that are only going to deteriorate or get worse or not be personally helped. And furthermore, to be able to lift our specialty even further by being precise and saying, this is your goal for your operation. Uh, we want to provide that to you. Let's see what the data shows. Let's see if we're going to be able to do that. So there are a couple approaches. We started out with uh, a multi-point frailty score, which is the creation of indices that predict uh, complication rates, length of stay, et cetera, and this is now easy to do in the electronic medical record. We have multiple data points. We published this and validated it in many different databases. It's linked to uh, complication incidents. It's linked to things that you wouldn't even imagine, like pseudoarthrosis, PJK. It's, it's kind of interesting to me, these multidimensional scores really having to do with comorbidity and social aspects of the patient are actually linked to things like PJK and, and pseudoarthrosis. Um, what we realized was, you know, we, we've been sold a bad bill of goods. We've wasted a lot of our resources, especially as surgeons, uh, dealing with the electronic medical record that was really designed like Epic for billing and not for extraction of data and not for providing us really useful information that's going to help us at the point of care. But if you substitute like a useful index like frailty for, as a surgeon, your predictive review of systems, then in real time at the point of care, then you, you can get useful information and you can still get billing for including your review of systems. So at UCSF, we uh, implemented this a few years ago, and automatically before I see the patient, this, the patient's 40-point frailty score is calculated using the power of big data, and immediately I get a stratification of that patient in terms of their complication risk compared to non-frail patients, and also an, an estimate of their increased length of stay uh, in the hospital. One of the important aspects that we deal with when we're looking at predictive analytics is we realize that we have known unknowns, and then as Rumsfeld used to say, we have a lot of unknown unknowns. Um, and if you look at our ability to predict, we're still less than 50% uh, collecting the data that actually will be predictive. This is a study that was done by Miguel Serra, our economist, who's actually our chief, chief scientist. He's not a statistician, he's actually an economist uh, who works with our group to create some of these models. And so we realized very quickly that we need to increasingly datafy our whole process. So we collect a 40-point frailty score, but also we need to collect other aspects that may be equally or even more important in our ability to predict. Um, me, uh, real objective measures of physical vitality, like walking speed, uh, muscle bulk, sit-to-stand times, etc. Mental frailty scores, all these are increasingly datafying the patient in a meaningful way that will allow us to predict. Uh, we now have a study going on where we collect the Meyer-Briggs uh, personality score, so we give our patients a personality uh, assessment. Uh, I don't have the data here, but we also uh, now collect telomeres. So we not only do um, uh, physical uh, chronological age in our predictions, but we actually include now genetic age, uh, and we're looking at that in a collaboration with Elizabeth Blackburn's lab, who won the Nobel Prize for, uh, for the uh, telomere. Uh, finding. And then furthermore, we have the ability to increasingly datafy the patient through chemical, uh, uh, chemical measures of frailty. Uh, many patients are in, in inflammators, they call them, as they age. They get increasingly inflamed. It's not infection. Uh, and this is why they develop such cardiovascular disease. And then we look at things like fibroblast activity, even SNPs, uh, morphine equivalent dose, uh, preoperative hematocrit, anemia, et cetera. So we've datafied 
uh, the patient. We also need to datify the surgery. If you're going to do predictive analytics, you need to say, okay, that, that surgery is a 75, that surgery is a 90, et cetera, right? Because um, you're, otherwise you're missing a big part of the equation. So we published uh, the development of the invasiveness index for these complex operations. You could do the same for tumor, for example. You could do the same for skull-based surgery, where you have to datify uh, the operation, and then you combine that with the substrate, the patient score on whom you're performing the surgery, and then you get uh, meaningful information. That's one approach. The other approach, uh, and where we've been going increasingly uh, directionally in our uh, large registries, is to look at everything together and actually allow the computers to look at the interaction among the different variables between the patient uh, and the procedure, for example. If you look at, historically, uh, surgeons versus machine, uh, and even surgeon performance in general, uh, there have been many studies, uh, mostly out of orthopedics. Uh, surgeons are very poor at predicting the risk of their operations, especially long term, especially the one and two year complication rates. Um, and in selecting the best operations for individual patients, this was a study of meniscal tears, trying to uh, predict uh, who's going to do well from surgical repair. And again, the surgeons did quite poorly. So our groups uh, believe that the power uh, in being able to do this, and importantly in being able to move our field forward, is not going to rely uh, on the development of a new 3D printed implant or a new screw, but is going to uh, be intimately dependent upon the unification of big data across the world. Uh, one of my jobs in the International Spine Study Group is outreach. So I recently started a group in Asia, a registry group in Asia. I started a group in Latin America. And then combined with the European group, uh, we think this is where we're going to go. And I'll just show you a couple uh, examples. Rather than quote your patient, I'm going to ask you just another very broad question for you guys to think about in your mind. When you talk to your patient about a complex operation, uh, big adult deformity PSO, how do you come up with the complication rate you quote that patient? Well, if you're diligent, you go in the literature and you say, OK, well, this is what the ISSG reported. Uh, for this operation. But remember, that's not specific at all. It's general, it's average data. Wouldn't it be powerful to be able to place your patient like this dot on the complication rate plot and say, actually, this is you. We predict your complication rate's going to be this at 72 hours after surgery, determining your need for ICU, and this is your complication rate one, two years after surgery, 90 days, et cetera. We can predict rate of complication after including the operative data. It gets a bit more um, uh, accurate. And importantly, we can identify red zone patients where they're at high risk of readmission uh, prior to discharge and direct resources such as a touchback with a PA to that patient and say, hey, you're at high risk of readmission. Let's touch back with you every 48 hours and try to keep you out of the ED and try to keep our quality metrics higher. One of the interesting things we found is that in terms of our uh, weight of prediction for complication was that a, a th uh, more than half of these are patient dependent, not procedural, and a third of those are potentially modifiable. And although we all think we're such wonderful surgeons and if you just have surgery by me, you're going to do much better than someone else, what we found was that the surgeon weight and the site weight in prediction was only 4 to 10 percent. And most of the model weight um, for complication was actually in, uh, in the patient substrate uh, itself. Um, so our group and many others are moving toward prehabilitation processes, and this is fueled by the power of big data, where we learned this from big data, that actually adjusting the patient's preoperative complication risk in whatever is modifiable, can, like things like preoperative physical therapy, preoperative pain management, psychiatry, optimized mood, optimized smoking, bone mineral density, can pay big dividends for us and actually impact our ability to predict. So we make the patient more predictable by actually eliminating the variability in their preoperative uh, risk. Um, this is a study showing ability to predict uh, risk of readmission in congestive heart failure, and this is really becoming mainstream. So I sort of beat up a little bit on complication being used as a filter, right, because you want to lift population health. So the other aspect that our group's been looking at is the ability to predict outcomes. You can't do cost-effectiveness research, you can't do uh, population health research unless you're able to actually combine complication rate and actually uh, cost uh, with, with outcomes. So just look at that scatter plot. That's actually every patient operated on in the registries in North America and Europe. And if you look at what, what tremendous heterogeneity in outcome from adult deformity operations. So if you're going to quote the patient, this is how you're likely to do, not just in terms of your complication, but in your outcome. If you quote that patient average data, 
only 5% of those patients had an average, uh, what would be considered an average improvement. So what we want to be able to do is to say, actually, this is you. We'll predict you specifically, individually. This is your likely uh, improvement. And we can now predict with about 75% accuracy the outcome of every instrument, SRS-22, ODI, SF-36, uh, at every time point from surgery uh, out uh, to two years. And I'll just sort of uh, finish up with maybe a couple more slides. If you're going to revisit outcome and you're going to lift population health and you take a deep dive in it in spine surgery, you have to know one important fact that we, we're still trying to sort out a little bit. Most of, the out, most of the model weight does not have to do with the sagittal plane. You couldn't have gone to a spine meeting in the last 20 years and not seen the Schwab SRS classification, and our calculus in our own head was, if you just realign the patient and get them back to the zero modifier, they're going to do great. But actually, if you look at the data in the model weight that predicts outcome, that is uh, less than the top 15. Most of the model weight is actually where the patient started. So it's aspects of the patient's disability status, not uh, the, whether you restore the sagittal plane uh, in these patients. And this is a, a sample of our outcome uh, prediction. Uh, and we can simulate waiting five years before we operate on the patient. We can simulate whether we stop at T10 or, or T4, for example. And then finally, and I'll just finish with this because I think this is maybe the, the coolest, not only can we predict SRS 22 outcome at two year, ODI outcome at two year, we can predict with 75, 80% accuracy the answers to each individual SRS 22 question. So that gets us to precision medicine, where someone says, I don't want to have surgery unless I'm going to walk better. We can go to the walking question in the SRS 22 and say, we can predict with 80% accuracy that you're going to have a significant improvement in your walking if we do this particular operation um, for you. And then maybe finally, I'll just touch on this in, in one minute. Um, if we turn the AI loose and we say to the AI, actually build us a new adult spinal deformity uh, classification, not one based on the sagittal plane that doesn't really matter, uh, which we've shown from big data now, but actually build us a new classification that takes risk and combines it with outcome. That's what we really want to know, right? And that's what our patients want to know. So now, immediately, if, we, if, we're, if you look on the left side of the screen, um, that's how a good surgeon these days would see the patient. Right now, they're doing frailty, they're doing ODI, they think they're being very comprehensive. This is how the machine sees the patient. This is you immediately. This is you in the context of patients that are most similar to you. How powerful would it be if we could immediately in real time say, actually, you are very similar to these 10 patients. Let me look up what I did to those patients. Let me look up what complications they had, how they did. That's something that's beyond human intelligence. I know I can't remember back five or 10 years and what operation I did on patients that are matched with 100 different variables and say, this is what I did. So rather than being based on the sagittal plane, which I show here has an R squared of 0.19 now with bigger data, and if you look at two-year SVA fused to pelvis, versus ODI. Remember this was our, our Bible, our Kool-Aid, our guidepost for years, R squared 0.04. <laughs> so this is now, this is where we are now, this is you. These are the patients most similar to you. And then we publish this, you can look it up if you want, but I'll just show you. Immediately in real time, we have a patient type, we have a procedure type, all identified by pattern recognition in the AI, and we plot Outcome versus risk. So the new adult spinal deformity classification is not going to be based on human. It's going to be based on AI. And one final comment. Look at the, up, the upper left graph. The patients that had the highest complication rates also had what? The greatest lift in their HRQOL. And that's what machine learning has shown us. Thank you.